Praise the Lord, everyone. It's good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. We're going to go into the word of the Lord. And uh, it is a privilege to be here in Singapore to worship with you and to share the word of the Lord. Now, we're going to be teaching tonight, and so as I go through it, I think you have an outline that's been handed to you, um, I believe. I'm not sure exactly how that works, but I do have an outline for you uh, at some point. But I encourage you, it's coming, okay. But I encourage you to take your own notes, because I will not necessarily go exactly by the outline. Uh, and also, it is important to... Uh, for you to think about what you should put down, not just follow the notes, but you need to get it in your own mind, in your own heart, and the best way to do that is to write it down. Engage your, your hands in that, and you'll learn it and uh, remember it much better that way. And as we go through it, if you have some questions, I will be happy to take questions. If uh, something is not clear or you need me to repeat something or you... Maybe something is a uh, question has been raised to your mind about something I've said, then uh, you can raise your hand and I will try to answer those questions. And if I don't get them all during the course of the teaching, then perhaps when we br take a break or come to the end of a subject, we can have some time for questions as well. There's so much to teach on that I cannot cover everything. Therefore, I want to make sure we cover things that you're interested in. And I know some questions you may have for yourself, for your own understanding. Some things you may understand for yourself, but you would like to know how to share it with someone else. And I understand that not all questions mean that you are lacking in understanding, but you're trying to find the best way to explain it, maybe to people who are not Christian or people from other groups that are Christian but don't have the same understanding, and you want to know the best way to do that. So we're going to try to give you that information. Tonight, I, my subject is the one true God. I'm going to talk about the one true God, the almighty God revealed in Jesus Christ. Amen. And uh, for a start, we're going to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6. The fifth book of Moses, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Beginning with verse 4, probably this is a familiar passage of scripture to you. But I think it's very important to lay the foundation here. I'm going to be reading a lot of scripture tonight, uh, and I'll try to give you the references for that. But everything we teach and preach must be based on the Bible, the Word of God. It's not our own personal opinion that's important. It's not the traditions of men that's important, but it's the Word of God that's important. Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning in verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. Shall talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, when thou risest up. Thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand. They shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. Thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. That's Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 through verse 9. Notice this is a foundational statement. Uh, even to this day, the Jews, if they are religious in any way, they must make this confession. Lord. If you'll notice carefully the word Lord in the King James Version, the New King James Version, other versions, is capitalized. Capital L, capital O, R, D, small capitals. And the reason for that is it's not merely the term uh, meaning ruler or master, but it's actually the name of God in the Old Testament. The name of, in English we often say Jehovah, and probably uh, the Hebrew pronunciation is something like Yahweh. No one knows for sure because the ancient Hebrews did not write the vowels down. And also they did not pronounce the name orally over the passage of time. The name of God was so sacred to them. They did not want to take God's name in vain. 
And so therefore they would not speak it out loud. But whenever they would come to a reading of this verse and others like it, they would substitute the Hebrew word Lord, Adonai. Uh, and that's what they would read when they were speaking out loud. And so the King James translators into English did the same thing. They substituted the English word Lord. But to let us know that this is not the normal word Lord, meaning a master or ruler, but this is specifically God's name in Hebrew, they capitalized it. So we could understand this to, to be saying, Hear, O Israel, Jehovah, or Yahweh, is our God. Yahweh is one. There's only one Jehovah. There's only one Yahweh. There's only one Lord. There's only one God. Now, this message is the foundation. Because if you'll notice, he said, Teach this at every opportunity. Teach it to your children when you get up in the morning. When you walk around during the day, when you sit down, when you go to bed at night, you tell them, there's only one God. He's the only one you shall serve. Give your whole heart to Him. Don't serve any other. He's the only one. And so from childhood, the Jews were trained to believe there's only one God. Now, this is a very important passage. It, he said that you will put it on your forehand and on your, your forehead. The Jews, the Orthodox Jews, even to this day, when they go to prayer in their homes, they will take a box that has this scripture in it, and they will bind it on their forehead, and they will bind it on their forearm. And that's to remind them that when they pray, they should only pray to the one true God. And then if you go into their store or if you go into their house, you'll find on the gate or on the doorpost of their house a little container, a scroll-shaped container, and inside will be this verse of Scripture. They try to take this literally because they understand that God has made a great emphasis on this. Throughout the Old Testament, you find the emphasis there's only one God. In the book of Isaiah, over 50 times it speaks of God as the Holy One. Never speaks of God as the Holy Two or the Holy Three, the Holy Four, or the Holy More. But only one, the Holy One. Now, if we go to the New Testament, in uh, Mark chapter 12, we find the words of Jesus relating to this commandment. A scribe came and asked Jesus, and you can read it in Mark, the Gospel of Mark chapter 12, verse 28. One of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, Which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. That's Mark chapter 12, verse 28 through verse 31. And so Jesus Christ said, this is the first and the greatest commandment. Our Lord himself is telling us, you know, sometimes people might say, well, why do you emphasize the oneness of God so much? You're causing confusion. You're causing division. You're causing separation from other Christian groups. And I will say, I am a preacher and teacher of the word of God. I don't have the right to preach what I like or even to emphasize what I like, but I must preach and teach the word of the Lord. And the Bible tells us throughout the Old Testament into the New Testament, there's only one God. The New Testament does not change that revelation. The New Testament does not contradict the Old, but it teaches the same message. There's only one God. Jesus himself said this is the foundation. So anyone else who would change that teaching, they are the ones who are causing confusion and division. We must go back to the Bible and find the emphasis of the Scripture. I don't know if I will have time this week to talk about how we in the principles of interpreting the Bible, but one way in which we apostolic believers look at the Bible a little differently than other groups is we believe that we should start with the foundation of the Old Testament and learn the basics from the Old Testament. Then we come into the New Testament, we have that understanding already in our minds. Now, we understand the New Testament is the greater revelation. But the, 
the Bible says in Galatians chapter 3, the law was a schoolmaster. Galatians 3, 24. The law was a schoolmaster or a tutor to bring us to Christ. How did the Jews or how did the disciples learn about truth? They started with the concepts of the Old Testament. When Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, repent. They knew about repentance from the Old Testament. When Paul and Silas had to speak to uh, the jailer in Philippi, and uh, he said, what must I do to be saved? They did not say repent. Why? He probably did not understand what that meant. They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So when they were dealing with a pagan who had no understanding, they would say, you cannot be saved by believing in your false gods. You can only be saved by turning to Jesus. And then they had to explain to him more about that. But when Peter preached to the Jews, he could say, repent. And they knew what that mean, meant. He could say, be baptized. They already had ceremonies of the Old Testament of washing and cleansing that made it uh, understandable for them. They already had the preaching of John the Baptist. He said, receive the Holy Spirit. They knew the Holy Spirit was the Spirit of God. And so what I'm saying is the Jews and the apostles in the New Testament, they had a foundation of the Old Testament. The same way with us. Now, we understand the greater revelation is found in the New Testament, but let me give you an example. If you're going to read English literature, you first have to learn the ABCs. If you're going to appreciate, you know, you know, Shakespeare's writings are much higher and much deeper and much richer than a first grade reader. But you have to understand the first grade reader, the ABCs, before you can understand Shakespeare. Uh, you know, calculus is far more advanced than arithmetic. But you have to understand that one plus one equals two before you can learn calculus. And even when you're doing calculus, you're still using those basic ideas from arithmetic. It never changes. You add to it, you develop more. Well, but you never change the original definitions, the original meanings. Now, when we come to the New Testament and we read about God, we read Jesus as God manifest in the flesh. We read about Father and Son and Holy Spirit. How do we understand those words? Unfortunately, most of Christianity reads those words through the traditions of later centuries. They take the def definition of God from Greek philosophy. They take the definition of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit from the 4th century and 5th century and 6th century creeds and writings. And when they read the Bible, they have that understanding already in their minds. And I'm saying that's the wrong way to read the Bible. Don't start with Greek philosophy. Don't start with church tradition. Don't start with the 5th century, the 4th century, or the creeds of man. But start with the Old Testament. The Old Testament definition of God will never change. There's only one God. He's absolutely one. He's a spirit. And so when you read in the New Testament that Jesus is God manifest in the flesh, he's not a second God. He's not a demigod. He's not added to God. He is the same God of the Old Testament revealed in the flesh. So we've got to start with the foundation. And Jesus himself said this is the foundation. And if you think about it carefully, everything that is unique about apostolic Pentecostals, every major doctrine that we emphasize is based on the foundation of the oneness of God. Think about it. We preach repentance from sin. Many groups just say, make a decision for Christ. And yes, you must make a decision. Believe on Jesus. Yes, you must do that. But we specifically emphasize there should be a repentance, a turn from sin to God, a change of your heart, your mind, your will. Why do we teach that? Because we know there's only one God, and He deserves all of our devotion. If we're going to serve God, we have to turn away from all the false gods and turn to the only true God. That's repentance. We emphasize baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. We'll talk a little bit about that later. But why do we say the name of Jesus is so important? Because it is the revelation of the one true God. When you're baptized in Jesus' name, you are expressing faith that Jesus is the only Savior. He is the one who is washing away your sins. If Jesus is not the only Savior, you're not going to be saved because you're putting all of your confidence and trust in Jesus. But that's okay because we know there's only one God. And He's been revealed in the flesh in Jesus Christ. 
And so when we understand the oneness of God, we understand the importance of baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. We understand the importance of receiving the Holy Spirit. Some people teach that you can receive Christ at one time, and then another time you receive the Holy Spirit. But we know there's only one Spirit of God, not two spirits, not three spirits. You cannot say, I, over here I feel uh, the Spirit of Jesus, and over here I feel the Holy Spirit. You cannot say, yesterday I received Jesus, today I received the Holy Spirit. You know, yesterday we felt Jesus in here, today we feel the Holy Spirit in here. You can't say that. There's only one Spirit of God. And if you're going to receive Jesus Christ in His fullness, how do you receive it? By receiving the Holy Spirit. And so, because we understand there's only one Spirit of God, we understand the importance of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's not just something extra, not just something optional, but it's part of God's plan of salvation. We teach joyful worship, exuberant worship. Why do we do that? Because there's only one God. He deserves all the praise, all the glory, all of our worship. We're to worship with our heart, our mind, our soul. And that includes the, the, the emotions as well as the intellect. And with all of our strength, we're not saving our strength to worship some other God. We're not dividing our worship among two or three persons. But when we worship, we're giving all of our devotion to the only true God. We, we emphasize a holiness of life, living a holy life, inwardly and outwardly. Why is that? Because we are the people of the name of Jesus. There's only one God, and we're devoted completely to Him. In the Old Testament, the Jews, the Hebrews, were known as the people of Jehovah. They were different in their dress. They were different in their eating habits. They were different in their keeping of the Sabbath so that people are all over the world, they could look at them and say, that's a Jew. That's a person that worships Jehovah. That's one of those people who is dedicated to Jehovah. Well, in the New Testament, we're not a physical race like the Jews of the Old Testament, but we are people called out of every nation and every race to serve the one true God. And we are exalting the name of Jesus. And, and so people need to see that we're different in our attitude, in our speech, in our dress. We don't think and act like the people of the world. Why? Because we are the people of the name of Jesus. We're called to be separated from sin unto God to bear the name of Jesus. And so we believe in holiness because we believe in one God. So everything we teach has got to rest on this foundation. You know, if you're going to study a religion, the first thing you're going to ask is, what is their concept of God? That's what you want to know first. If you want to understand Islam, you have to understand their concept of God. If you're going to uh, study Hinduism, you have to understand what is their concept of God. Of God, What do they think? And so it is. In the Old Testament, when God called Moses in Exodus chapter 3 and said, I want you to deliver Israel from the bondage of Egypt. And uh, Moses was afraid. He didn't think he could do the job. And so he asked, well, who shall I say is sending me? Well, he asked for the, for the people's sake, but I think he needed it for his own sake too because he would have known what to tell the people. But he needed that confidence. And what did God answer? I am that I am. You tell them that I am has sent you. God answered with a revelation of his name and his identity. That's where you must start. And that's a revel great revelation in itself. I am that I am. That means the eternal one, the self-existing one, the one who uh, lives by his own power and his own strength. Not I was or even I shall be, but I am. Amen. You know, when we introduce ourselves, no matter what great title we might use, it's a very limiting title. If someone would say, well, I am the President of the United States. That's a very powerful title. But actually, it's a limiting title. Because if you're the President of the United States, you're not the President of Russia. You're not the President of China. You're only the President of the United States. So no matter how great a title, it limits you. But God has no limitations. He simply says, I am. I am that I am. In other words, he can be whatever he wants to be. 
He can be whatever you need him to be. Maybe you think of it as I am followed by a blank. And you put in whatever you need. If you're, if, if you're lost in sin, he says, I am the Savior. If you're sick in your body, I am the healer. If you're hungry, I am the bread of life. If you're thirsty, I am the living water. If you need direction, he says, I am the bright and morning star. If you need help and encouragement, I am the good shepherd. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I am the rock of ages. I am the first and the last and everything in between. Hallelujah. It's a revelation of who he is. I am that I am. In the New Testament, same thing. Saul of Tarsus, he thought he was serving God, doing God's will by persecuting the Christians. God struck him with a light from heaven. And instantly Saul knew, my thinking is wrong. I thought I was serving God, but God is not pleased with what I'm doing. So what's the first question that he asked? Who are you, Lord? I've got to go back to the foundation. I thought I understood, but obviously I don't. So where do I begin? My concept of God. Who are you, Lord? And the Lord, Saul, later of course, Paul, was speaking as a Jew, trained in childhood. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. He was not saying, is there another God out there? No, he knew there was only one God. And is there another Lord out there? No, he knew there was only one Lord. So when he said, who are you, Lord? He was saying, God, I know there's only one God. I thought I was in a relationship with you. I thought you were pleased with what I'm doing. But obviously you're not. Who are you really? And the Lord did not correct the question. You know, if the question is a bad question, a good teacher will say, no, that's the wrong question. You can't ask that sort of question. It will lead to the wrong conclusion. So the Lord didn't say, well, you're, you're mistaken. There's two of us up here. Uh, he didn't say, well, you know one of us, but I want to introduce the next one to you. No, he accepted the question, who are you, Lord, the one Lord of the Old Testament? And the Lord accepted that, answered it. I am Jesus, the very one you are persecuting. Praise God. A revelation of the oneness of God. So we've got to start with the foundation. Let me go through the book of Isaiah here for a few minutes and show you how important it is to have an understanding of the oneness of God. Now, I'm, gonna, I'm going to uh, read pretty fast here, so you're going to have to listen fast. All right, Isaiah 37, 16. Isaiah chapter 37, verse 16. O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, that dwellest between the cherubims, thou art the God, even thou alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. Thou hast made heaven and earth. Going forward to Isaiah chapter 42, verse 8. I am the Lord. Or in other words, I am Jehovah, that is my name. My glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. So God will not share his glory with anyone else. If you find someone who has all the glory of God, he is God. Because God does not share his glory with another. Isaiah 43, 10 through 11. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, my servant whom I have chosen that you may know and believe me and understand that I am He. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Now, as we're going through Isaiah, I want you to notice two things. The first one, God is absolutely one. He's using the strongest possible language to show that He is the only God. Now, some people say God is a plurality of persons, but he, they're, they're in unity. It's like they're counseling together. They're uh, in unity. They're always agreeing. Well, if that's all that God meant, he could have said, we agree. We're united. We're in union. But instead, he uses very absolute language. Alone. No other. No one else to share my glory. 
Could you think of any stronger language? As we go through this, you'll find if God was really trying to say he's one, there's no stronger language that he could use. It's not merely a union or unity or agreement. It's absolute oneness. So that's the first point I want you to see, the absolute language of one and only God. Second thing I want you to see is as we go to the New Testament, this language points to Jesus. You see, the Old Testament speaks about Jehovah, the God of Israel. The New Testament uses the same terms to talk about Jesus. For example, here in Isaiah 43 and verse 11, I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Jehovah says, I'm the only Savior. But when we come to the New Testament, Jesus says, I'm the Savior. Well, how can that be true? The only way that can be true is if we recognize Jesus as Jehovah of the Old Testament revealed in the flesh. So when we put this together with the New Testament, we find that it continually points to Jesus as the revelation of the one true God. So I want you to notice that as we continue. In Isaiah 44, verse 6, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, that is Israel's Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, I am the last. Beside me there is no God. Verse 8, this is Isaiah 44, 8, Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time, and have declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God, I know not any. Now you can take this literally or symbolically, however you want to take it. But he says, there's no other God beside me. So if you expect to go to heaven and look at one God sitting beside another God, that's not correct. There's no God beside me, he said. 24 and verse 24. Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb. Notice, the one who created you and the one who redeemed you is the same God. Not another God. He says, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. He said, I did it all alone. I did it by myself. How, how much more could he emphasize this? He's using the strongest possible language. Alone, by myself, no one else, none beside me. First, I'm the first, I'm the last. There's no one else. You see, our Creator and our Savior are one and the same. Let me give you an example. Let's say I need some money, so I steal, oh, $1,000 from Brother Willoughby. I don't know if he has $1,000, but let's just say that he's rich. And I, I steal $1,000 from Brother Willoughby. And I get to feeling so bad about that. I know it's wrong. And so I repent. And I say, you know, I don't need to be doing that. And so I give the $1,000 to this young man right over here. And I say, you know, it's not right for me to keep it. I stole this money. I'm going to give it to you. I repent. Please forgive me. And, of course, he gladly accepts the money, and he forgives me. Is everything okay? Yes, he said he would think so. Of course. But the rest of you, is everything okay? Of course not. What's the problem? If I'm truly going to repent, I must go back to the man I sinned against. And I must make it right to him. He's the only one who can forgive me in this situation, humanly speaking. Well, we human beings, we sinned against our Creator. Against our Heavenly Father. Against the one who gave the law. And so how can we go to Jesus and say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins? The only way that Jesus has the power and authority to forgive us of our sins is if he is the one God manifested in the flesh. Only then does he have the right to forgive us. Praise God. So our creator must be our savior. He's the only one who could do it. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 5. And verse 6, I am the Lord, and there is none else. 
There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. Isaiah uh, 45, the same chapter, 21 through 23. Tell ye, and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. Who had declared this from ancient time, who had told it from that time, have not I the Lord? And there is no God else beside me. A just God and a Savior, there is none beside me. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, there is none else. If you want to be saved, you have to look to me, he says. Because there is no one else you can look to. I have sworn by myself, and the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness. See, God has the authority to swear. We don't, because we don't have the power to make it happen. We, we don't have power over what we would swear by. But God swears by himself, because there's no one else to swear by. There's no one equal to him. There's no one greater than him. So he swears by himself. And he says, The word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Now, that's Jehovah speaking. Do you know how this is going to be fulfilled? Well, if you know the New Testament, you can look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 9 through verse 11. And it tells us that at the name of Jesus, if you study the Greek, it means at the mention of the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The way that scripture of Isaiah is going to be fulfilled is at the mention of the name of Jesus. Jehovah said it about himself, but it's fulfilled in Jesus because he is Jehovah manifested in the flesh. Isaiah 46 and 5. To whom will you liken me? And make me equal and compare me that we may be like. And going down to verse 9, Isaiah 46, 9. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, there is none else. I am God, there is none like me. There's nobody like God. Nobody is God's equal. God is unique. God is alone. There's no one to compare to him. If you find someone who is exactly like God in every way, he is God, because there's nobody like God. Isaiah, uh, let's see, 54 and 5. For thy maker is thine husband. The creator is the bridegroom. Thy maker is thine husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. Thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. The God of the whole earth shall he be called. Now, over and over you see the emphasis. Some will appeal to, and that's Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. If you look at the creation story in Genesis 1, 26, it says... And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. He uses the plural pronouns, let us make man. And so some would suppose that there must be more than one God who created us. But scripture, all of scripture is the word of God. So one part of the Bible does not contradict another part of the Bible. If, it, if it's true, it has to be consistent. And so we've already read in Isaiah 44, 24, where God said, I stretched forth the heavens alone. I spread abroad, abroad the earth by myself. So in whatever way we're going to understand Genesis 1, it has to be consistent with Isaiah. So how are we going to understand this? Well, for a start, if you, if you look at the very next verse in Genesis 1, 27, you find the fulfillment. It says, So God created man in his own image. 
In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. It turns back to singular pronouns. God created man in his image. If you look at the man that he created, look at Adam. Adam is one person. He's one personal being, one mind, one will, one personality. And he is the image creature. He is the reflection of his creator. And so that would show you that his creator was one personal being. Adam was not three persons. Adam was one person. And as such, he is a reflection of the God who created him. So why would God use the plural? Well, perhaps the, 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 most, the simplest answer is it is a plural of deliberation. It's showing God's planning, God's decision, God's deliberation. In English, for example, uh, if you're planning, thinking about something, you might say this, let's see. What am I going to do today? Let's see. Let's see literally means let us see. When you say let's see, who are you talking to? You're talking to yourself. That's an example of where we humans can use this plural of deliberation, the plural of thinking. To, and, and so it seems that Genesis uses this to show that when God created man, he was planning it. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't a mistake. But he was deliberating. He was deciding. He was making a choice. In fact, we find that God works all things this way. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 11 tells us that God works all things together after the counsel of his own will. So who does God counsel with? Himself. The counsel of his own will. So that's one way that's very easy for us to understand Genesis 1.26. And that would be consistent with Isaiah. I talked to a Jewish rabbi in the city of Jerusalem and I asked him. He said the Jews think that God was addressing the angels. Not that the angels actually participated in creation, but the angels were present. The angels are created before humans. And God was informing them of his plans that I'm going to create humans in the image of God, but also they will share the image of the angels. That is, being able to think and to feel, to worship, to commune with God. And so the Jews explain it that way. God was speaking to the angels. So I've given you a couple of explanations for that. But my main point is to show you that you don't have to contradict the rest of Scripture in order to understand Genesis. And the way to understand Genesis is to understand there's only one God. All right. Let's go into the New Testament. We'll find the same emphasis on the oneness of God. The New Testament does not contradict the Old, but it repeats the same message, there's only one God. For example, in Galatians chapter 3, in verse 20, Galatians chapter 3, verse 20. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Now I like this verse because it's very simple, very plain. God is one. I've talked to people that say, well, I believe in one God, but I believe one God in three persons. And I say, what, how can you say that? What does that mean? And so we go back and forth. Do you believe in one or three? They say, one God. But P.S., three persons. But this doesn't say one God. This simply says God is one. So you decide. What term would you like to use to call, describe God? If you want to speak of him as spirit, then God is one spirit. If you want to speak of him as being, God is one being. If you're going to speak of God as person, you have to say God is one person. Because whatever God is, he's one of that. Not more. God is one. James 2.19 says, Do you believe in one God? Well, you do well. Even the demons believe in one God and tremble. They understand. Satan knows how many gods were sitting on the throne that he was trying to ascend to uh, be like God. Satan knows how many gods cast him out of heaven. It was one God. 
And so even the demons understand there's only one God. Now let's go to 1 Timothy 2.5. This uh, teaches the New Testament message about God in a nutshell. If you can understand this verse, you can have a good understanding of the doctrine of God in the New Testament. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5. It begins, there is one God. Now see, this is the same message as the Old Testament. The New Testament does not change the Old Testament. The New Testament builds upon it. It doesn't contradict it. doesn't change it. There is one God. Everything we learned in the Old Testament is still true. In fact, you remember the story of uh, Jesus speaking to a woman at the well in Samaria in John chapter 4? And they were talking about worshiping God. And Jesus said this in John 4.22. You worship, you know not what. We know what we worship. For salvation is of the Jews. So Jesus was saying to this woman, the Jewish concept of God is correct. The Jewish concept of absolutely one God and no other. That's right. Of course, the Jews needed to understand who Jesus was, but that's what I'm coming to now. Now, go, going back to 1 Timothy 2.5, for there is one God. The New Testament does not change or contradict the old, but it adds new and greater revelation. What is the new revelation of the New Testament? It's not a different God, not a new person of God. What's the new revelation of the New Testament? That the one God has come into the flesh to be our Savior. The new revelation is Jesus Christ. And you'll notice here, there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Now notice, it's not adding to the Godhead, but it says the man, Christ Jesus. A mediator is a go-between, someone who stands in the middle and reconciles two parties together. Uh, and, and Jesus Christ is the one who reconciles us as humans to God. Now, how does he do that? Let's think about this. Sin separated us from God. And so in, other, in, in order for us to be restored to fellowship with God, we need a mediator. We need a savior. We sinful humans cannot make ourselves holy. And God cannot make himself sinful. So seemingly there's no basis for fellowship. How can that, that uh, gap be bridged? Well, God came in the flesh as the only sinless human who's ever lived. And so as a sinless human, he could, have, could restore fellowship with God. Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. He's both God and man at the same time. So in his own body, in his own identity, he unites deity and humanity. He unites God and man. So we can think of Jesus as the meeting place of God and man. Jesus is not bringing us to someone else. Jesus is bringing us to himself because God was in Christ. In fact, you can see it in 2 Corinthians 5.19. God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. Not to someone else, but unto himself. And so Jesus Christ becomes the meeting place of God and men. And so we find here, there is, uh, again, going back to 1 Timothy 2.5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Christ in his humanity becomes the meeting place of God and man. Now let's think about it. Let us suppose there was two persons in the Godhead. And let us suppose they're equal in every way. Equal in power, equal in holiness, every way. All right? We as sinful human beings, we need a mediator to bring us back to the first person. Could the second person become that mediator? No. If the second person is equal in power and holiness to the first person, we would need a mediator to be back in fellowship with the second person just as much. The second person could not come down and be the mediator. We would have to have a mediator to be reunited with the second person. My point is, it's not a divine person that becomes the mediator. 
But it is the man, and that's why you see the scripture is very clear and accurate. It is the man, Christ Jesus. According to the flesh, Christ becomes the mediator or the meeting place that restores God and man together. Praise God. Now that is the message of the New Testament. There's one God, and we are restored to fellowship with God through the man, Christ Jesus. It's no second person of the Godhead. That wouldn't work here. It's a true man who is God manifested in the flesh. In the same vein, you find in John chapter 17. Now this, this goes along the same, uh, the same thought. If you start in John chapter 17, verse 1, shortly before the crucifixion, Jesus prayed this prayer. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. Now let me pause right here. It is, is it surprising to you that Jesus prayed? Some people say, well, if Jesus prayed, how could he be God? Or Jesus must be a second person. But let me just say this. It would be very surprising if Jesus did not pray. Because what we must understand, Jesus was a true man, true human being in every way, just like us, except for sin. Now, when I say except for sin, we know that sin was not originally part of the human race. God did not create Adam and Eve in sin. He created them as innocent, sinless. So the way God intends for humans to be is without sin. Sin is a foreign element. Sin is a foreign government. That's come into our lives by our bad choices. But Jesus came as the true human being, the way God originally created human beings. But in order to be the sacrifice for our sins, in order to take our place, in order to be our substitute, in order to shed blood for us, Jesus had to be fully human like us in every way except for sin. So everything that we humans do in relationship to God Jesus had to be able to do the same thing. In, everything, in every way that we humans would speak about God, Jesus had to be able to speak the same way. If he couldn't speak about God, if he couldn't pray to God, if he couldn't relate to God the same way we would, then he couldn't really be our, take our place. He wouldn't really be fully human. So we must understand that Jesus was truly human. The prayers of Christ do not prove another person of the Godhead. If they did, they would prove too much. You know why? If they prove that Jesus is a second person of the Godhead, they would also prove what kind of second person he is. They would prove he's a weak person, an inferior person, someone who needs to pray to someone else. So if you're going to use the prayers of Christ to prove he's a second person in the Godhead, you must also use it to prove what kind of person in the Godhead. Inferior. But that's not what it's proving. It's proving that he was a true human being, an authentic human. It shows that he was a real human. He prayed, the book of Hebrews says, in the days of his flesh. It's not as God that he needed to pray. It's only according to the flesh that he needed to pray. And so we see this example here in John chapter 17 of Jesus praying. And he addressed God as Father. All right? Now, if you go to John chapter 17, verse 3, notice what he says. In John chapter 17, verse 3, And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Now, he says, here is the... So he's saying the Father is the only true God. Now, if you have this idea that Father is one person and Son is a second person and Holy Spirit is a third person, there's something very strange here. You don't have to believe in all three members of the Trinity to be saved, but you only have to believe in maybe two of them. But the third one is not important. But it's something worse. The first one is the only one who's truly God. 
if the term Father is just one of three persons of the Trinity, He's the only one that's truly God. And then we should all become Jehovah's Witnesses. But we're not going to do that. There's too much scripture against that. But what is he saying? That they might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ. Is it saying you must know two members of the Trinity be saved, but not the third member? No, that wouldn't make sense. It's not talking about the Trinity at all. But it goes back to this. If you're going to be saved, you must worship the one true God. That makes sense, right? If there's only one God who created us, you, you must acknowledge him. But that's, that's necessary, but it's not sufficient. Why? The Jews of Christ's day, they believed in the one true God, but many of them rejected Jesus. The Muslims today, they worship one God. They say they worship the one God of the Bible, but they don't believe that Jesus is the Savior. So it's necessary to worship one God, the Creator, but that's not enough. If you're going to be saved, you must also recognize the plan of salvation that God has provided. And what is the plan of salvation? It's in Jesus Christ. And so you must worship God, but specifically you must recognize that He's come in the flesh as Jesus Christ, that as a man, Jesus died for your sins and rose again, and you must identify with His death, burial, and resurrection. So the pathway to salvation is to believe in the only true God and to believe that Jesus Christ is the revelation of God, the man sent from God to die for our sins. That's the way to be saved. Praise God. So it has nothing to do with different persons in the God. It, it has to do with God's plan of salvation in Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Now, let me just hasten on for just a, a few moments here. We know from Scripture that God is a spirit. John chapter 4, verse 24 says, God is a spirit. They, the worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. So that means that God is invisible to us. God does not have a body of flesh and bones and blood like we do, but he's an invisible spirit. So we should not think of God as a giant human. When we read scriptures about heaven is his throne and earth is his footstool, we should not go to the North Pole and see where's God's feet. Is this God's feet sitting on the top of the North Pole? No. That's a foolish way to think of it. God is not a giant... It talks about the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the earth. Do we think there's a big eyes rolling around? No. We understand that this is terminology to help us describe what God is like. He knows everything. The, the theological term for that is omniscient, all-knowing. He's everywhere present. The term for that is omnipresent. He's all-powerful omnipotent, all right? And that's because God is a spirit. If he were a giant person of flesh, he couldn't be everywhere. He couldn't be all-powerful. You could run from him. You could hide from him. But because he's a spirit, he's everywhere present. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. It's very important to understand this concept of God. It helps us to get away from some of the false thinking of many people. For example, when Christ was baptized, some people will use this as an example. In Matthew chapter 3 is one place you can look at it. When Jesus Christ was baptized in the Jordan River, John the Baptist baptized him. There was a voice from heaven that said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. And then the Spirit descended upon him in the form of a dove. So some people say, Aha, here is Trinity, three persons. The Father is a voice from heaven. The Son is standing in the water the Holy Spirit descending like a dove. But if you think of God as omnipresent present and all-powerful, you won't try to divide him up into three persons. For example, we can pray here in Singapore, the Spirit of God can move. There can be a voice from heaven. There can be tongues and interpretation. Somebody might have a vision or a dream, right, of God. God could reveal himself in some miraculous way. But the same thing could happen in America. The same thing could happen in China. The same thing could happen in India all at the same time. Four different places there could be a voice from heaven or a vision or a dream. Does that mean God is four persons? 
No, it means God is everywhere, and God is all-powerful, and God can do whatever he wants to do. But there's still only one God. Now, in the case of the baptism of Christ, we know there was a reason for the voice from heaven. Jesus explained it. You can look it up in John chapter 12. He said, the voice did not come for my sake. It came for your sake. Is a sign to the people. You know, Jesus could have stood up and said, I am the Messiah. I'm the Son of God. I'm God manifest in the flesh. But that would not have been credible. People could not have accepted that because it would seem that he is speaking for himself. But when the voice from heaven spoke, that was a confirmation miraculously of who Jesus was. So the purpose is not to prove two persons. The purpose is to reveal to the people that Jesus is the Messiah. The same thing, the Spirit descending like a dove, you can read about in John chapter 1. John the Baptist said, this was a sign. God told me the one that I would see the dove descending upon, he's the one that's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So it was a sign for John. Again, it wasn't trying to teach another person. It was, trying, it was a specifically a sign for John the Baptist. So when we understand the omnip, omnipotence of God and omnipresence of God, God could speak from heaven. God could send his spirit in the form of a dove. And God could be fully incarnated or in Christ Jesus at the same time. When we say God was manifest in the flesh, we don't mean God's spirit was limited to one body. We mean God's character and his power and his authority was invested in Christ. But we know God's spirit is everywhere. And so God can still speak from heaven. God can still send a sign in the form of a dove. And God can be in Christ at the same time. One God can do these things. Now, if that was a revelation of the Trinity, it would have been the first time in history that this would have been a revelation of the Trinity. Because the people of the Old Testament, they only knew one God. Moses didn't know of a trinity. Abraham didn't know of a trinity. They only knew one God. If the baptism of, the, of Christ was a display of the trinity, it would have been the first time. And you should see in the record, everybody saying, wow, now we know there are three persons. Now we see three persons here. I mean, this would be the time of revelation. This would be the time where it's revealed. But when you read the account, you don't read anything like that. All you read is, is they put their faith in Jesus. Because that was the significance of the baptism of Christ. Not to reveal a trinity, but to reveal Jesus Christ as the Messiah. It was his public anointing for the beginning of his ministry. And that's how the people received it. But we're understanding that there's one God, and he can operate in these ways. Now, the Bible does speak of God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let's talk about this for just a minute. When the Bible says God is Father, that is a title of relationship. Father is a term of relationship. Now, I have three children. My oldest son is 19 years old. So 19 years ago, before he was born, I was not a father. Suddenly he was born. Suddenly I became a father. I didn't change my personality. I didn't split into two. I'm still the same person. But I entered into a new relationship. So when we say God the Father, we're speaking of God in relationship to the human race. It's not a different person than Jehovah. It's the same person, the same God. But thinking of him in terms of relationship to us. For example, there are many... Verses that speak of God as Father, but Malachi chapter 2, verse 10 says, Hath not one God created us? Have we not all one Father? So that verse speaks of God as our Father in the sense of creation. He's the Father of the whole human race because He's the one that gave us life. In a special sense, He's the Father of the believers through spiritual birth, new birth. Or adoption is another way to look at it. And then God was specially the father of the baby Jesus because no human caused the conception in the womb of Mary. But God's spirit did a miracle and caused the conception of that baby. Therefore, God was the father of that baby. In fact, 
Let's look at this in Luke chapter 1, in verse 35. Luke chapter 1. And this will tell you the meaning of the term son as well. These are the words that the angel Gabriel told Mary before Jesus was conceived. In Luke, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verse 35. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest, that's the power of God, shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee. That God was the father of the child. Again, we're talking about relationship. God in relationship to humanity. But notice the term son. Now here's my question. Why is Jesus called the son of God? You see the word therefore? Somebody says if you see the word therefore, you always ask what it's there for. <laughs> and it's there to make a connection. Why is Jesus called the son of God? Because the spirit of God caused his conception. So we call Jesus Son, not because he's an eternal second person whose name is Son, but we call Jesus Son because God's Spirit caused him to be born. He's not the son of Joseph. He's not the son of any earthly man, but he's the Son of God. You know, just as my son is my son, because I'm the one who caused the conception, so Jesus is the Son of God because God caused the conception. Now, it was not in a physical way. It was by an invisible spiritual miracle. That's why it says the Holy Spirit. But you see, this is the scriptural definition of the Son of God. The term Son relates to the incarnation, to the birth of Jesus. Jesus is eternally God. But he was not eternally son, because son relates to the incarnation, to the flesh, to the birth. The Bible speaks of the death of the son. We cannot think of God's spirit as dying, but we think of flesh as dying. So the term son always relates to flesh. It always relates to time. It speaks of God as he is manifested in the flesh. All right, so the term father is God in relationship to humans. The term son means God manifested in flesh. And then the term Holy Spirit. Remember, God is spirit and God is holy. In fact, God is the Holy One. God is the only one who is holy in himself. If we're going to be holy, we must receive holiness from God. If the angels are holy, it's because they receive holiness from God. Angels are not holy by their own identity. What happens when angels sin? They become the devil. They're not holy anymore. They're only holy as long as they're in relationship with God. So if you're going to think of the one Holy Spirit, who is that? That's God. God is the Holy Spirit. So, why, so the Holy Spirit is not a different person. The Holy Spirit is God himself. Now you might ask, why do we need this title if it's just the same? Well, because Holy Spirit specifically refers to God in spiritual action. God in action. For example, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 through, and verse 2. The very first mention of God's Spirit. Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Genesis 1, 2, the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the Spirit of God moved on the face of the waters. God in action. Now, if I said, the Father is here today. The Father is in this building. We might look around and say, where is he? But if I say, the Holy Spirit is here today. The Holy Spirit is moving here then we immediately understand. I'm not talking about some physical, physical or visible manifestation, but I'm talking about the invisible presence of God. You see this in the life of Jesus. When, it, when the Bible is talking about Jesus' relationship as a man to God, 
it uses the term Father. Jesus prayed. That's a relationship. Our Father. But when the Bible is talking about the action of God in the life of Jesus, it says the Spirit. Jesus was led by the Spirit. Jesus worked miracles by the power of the Spirit. Jesus was conceived by the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. Now, if you think about it, the one who causes conception is the Father. But Matthew 1.18 says that Mary was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Matthew 1.18, also 1.20. That which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. So Jesus was actually conceived by the Holy Spirit. If the Father and the Holy Spirit are two different persons, then Jesus had two different fathers. But when we understand that the Holy Spirit is the Father, then there's only one person of God. But we use the term Father for relationship. We use the term Spirit for action. And that way the Bible is very clear. For example, the Mormons, they deny that the Holy Spirit caused conception. They believe there was a physical conception of the Father and Mary. Sad to say. But the Bible protects us from that false doctrine by saying the Holy Spirit overshadowed her. So we know it was an invisible spiritual miracle. So what I'm telling you is we, we think of Father, it's God in relationship to humans. When we say Son, God manifested in the flesh. Holy Spirit, God in spiritual action. But these are not three different persons. These are three different titles for the work of God. But there's one personal God who performs these works. Just as I'm a father, I'm a son, I'm a husband. But I'm not three different persons. I'm one personal being. Why does God work in our lives as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Not because this is His eternal nature. No, the reason why God is revealed in these ways is specifically for our salvation. In order for us to be saved, we had to have someone to take our place and die for our sins. So God had to come in flesh as the Son in order to redeem us. But in order for the Son to be born, God had to be the Father. No human could be the Father because then that child would be sinful. So the only solution was for God to be the Father. Now, Jesus died 2,000 years ago, but we have to be saved right now. Jesus died for the whole world, but the whole world is not automatically saved. How can we be saved today? It's because the Holy Spirit the Spirit of God applies that work to our lives today. So in order for that work of 2,000 years ago to be made personal in our lives, God has to come invisibly today as the Spirit. So the reason why God works as Father, Son, and Spirit is not for His benefit. It's not His eternal nature, but it's to work out our salvation. He has to be Father, Son, and Spirit all at the same time in order to to bring salvation to us. When we understand that. We understand that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit does not contradict the oneness of God. But these are three manifestations, not persons, not personalities, not three different minds, not three different bodies, but one God who works in three different ways to bring about our salvation. And of course, there's one name that reveals it all at the same time, and that's the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. You know, you can know me in a personal relationship. My children know me as father. You can know me as teacher. You can know me by my word. You can read my books. You can hear my speech. And you can know many things about me without ever meeting me personally. You can also know me by my spirit. If you sit down and talk with me, you can feel my spirit. You'll know if I have a good spirit, a bad spirit, angry spirit. Those are different ways of knowing me. But my word is not a different person from me. My spirit is not a different person from me. Those are ways you can know me. But if you want to summarize the whole thing, use my name, David Bernard. That covers all of my word. That covers all of my spirit. That covers everything I do. 
it's all wrapped up in one name. And so we know God as Father, we know God as Son, we know God as Holy Spirit, we know God in many ways. But if we want to wrap it all up in prayer, without having to have a long list of names and titles, but if we need help right here, right now, what's the one name we can call? We can call on the name of Jesus. Hallelujah! And all power in heaven and earth is revealed in the name of Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Well, I think it's time for a break of a few minutes. Is that right, Brother Willoughby? We'll take, what, five, ten-minute break, ten-minute break, and we'll come back and we'll do part two.